Okay, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so glad to be hosting Atlas Preservation here. Atlas Preservation at um, this wonderful workshop. They've been so great touring the whole country, one state per day or almost. Um, and we are at the end of their tour. And this is Jonathan, who'll be doing all the presentations for us today. And this is Pete Van Motter, who's the person we work with at the church and he's responsible for the graveyard. Um, so Pete will just say a couple words about the church. It's very historic, um, which is why we chose this location. Um, there's a lot of Revolutionary War patriots in here, and that's another reason why um, us as a DAR chapter have been associated with this church. So I'll just let Pete give you a few comments. Hello, uh, I've been superintendent of the cemetery for some over 30 years, I guess, now at this point. And, uh, this congregation was founded in 1699. They're basically of Dutch origin. Um, they started coming over in long boats, literally rolling over uh, under sail, uh, rolling over from Long Island, which is the original origin of uh, much of the Dutch community. And uh, as I say, this was founded in 1699. And is, this is the mother church, Old Brook Church is the mother church of several uh, of the Reformed churches in this area, would be a Hondel uh, Reformed Church, Colts Neck Reformed Church, um, one in Keyport, one in Hazlitt, one in Long Branch, and we're thinning down. There's only a couple of us left that are still so fairly active. Um, we have services here every uh, every Sunday at 9.30 in the morning. We'd like some of you to stop in and you're welcome to walk through the church today. And, uh, as the sunlight comes through the windows, you can see they're quite uh, remarkable. Uh, we have a full pipe organ, it's not electronic, so it's kind of a memorable experience when you, when you do come to service here. Uh, it's almost kind of a non-denominational, it's very close to being Presbyterian um, and Methodist. Uh, You'll be very comfortable with our order of worship here. Um, in the summertime when it's so hot because this building does not have any air conditioning, we meet in the with our church building on the other side there, and there are uh, restrooms on the second floor there. You go up about six steps, and to be a uh, rest area if the need arises. Uh, we have some uh, burials here on a, on a yearly basis, but not many. Uh, most of the ground is now is all been sold off, and we reserve whatever is left to uh, current active family members within the congregation, or uh, if you can prove the birthright to those lots that have been sold uh, in the past, that we let people uh, be interred also uh, as, as uh, so they can keep their families together in generations. Usually we go back uh, two generations at least, maybe three, depending on the circumstances. But uh, part of the problem that we have is obviously, like everybody else, is money. Um, when these plots in this area were sold off, they were probably sold for $25 or $30 for four to six plots. And our mowing bill is about $6,200 a year. Uh, and um, we got a good crew. They take good care of this uh, place for us. Uh, under the circumstances of mowing a cemetery is a miserable undertaking on, on a good time. Uh, being here this morning and um, <clears throat> thank you for um, <clears throat> excuse me inviting us to um, to do a gravestone preservation workshop here and learn about the history and how to clean and repair gravestones um, in a in a safe and uh, effective manner um, so um, sorry we're a little uh, behind we just got here just barely on time after we had a, a really hot event yesterday in Delaware and then a, a few hour drive um, but uh, anyway moving forward we have a beautiful day it's good to be back in Jersey here and uh, almost uh, my backyard <laughs> and, um, I grew up in, uh, in Fairfield County in Connecticut which is quite close to New York and you know the other side of Jersey is right on the other side of New York so this is like you know pretty close to home for me and um, so, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we just completed uh, most of this tour. We have actually another week to go, and uh, heading from here to uh, toward upstate New York, and then through all the New England states, and uh, completing the 48-state 
workshop tour adventure on a week from today in Connecticut, right near our building, and we're having a party after that to uh, celebrate. And uh, so anyway, uh, just a little background information about how I got to do what I do, and then we'll get started. The idea is to get everyone up and moving around and to be interactive, and we're gonna get um, cleaning some of these stones pretty quickly, and, um, and then we'll work on some of the other repairs. Um, so I got involved with the cemeteries initially in the 1980s. I did not have a historic family or a background connection to graveyards and cemeteries. It was something that came to me and it was uh, through some uh, circumstances that someone knew someone and uh, they needed someone to do the work uh, do installing monuments. And in my neck of the woods, uh, it's pretty highly populated. A lot of the work of the installation of monuments was done by subcontractors. So one thing led to another and I became a monument installer in 1986, 87. And then that quickly led me into also digging the graves because there was a need for that and they approached me ultimately. And so I was a cemetery contractor without planning to have that career path. At that time I was working as a carpenter actually and uh, had a very diverse background and have worked in many different trades. Uh, so uh, as time went on, I got more interested into the historical aspect of the gravestones and monuments and I happened to be working in and around some of literally the oldest existing gravestones in Connecticut which are some of the oldest in America actually the oldest dated gravestones in America that I know of are in Connecticut that are outside and for example Reverend Yu at 1644 in Palisado Cemetery in Windsor Connecticut the first uh, reverend of the church there is a readable box crypt tomb that's carved in Connecticut sandstone and um, and so there's there's other old ones as well anyway as time went on I got more interested in the historical aspect and I was able to seek out a lot of training and knowledge through numerous avenues uh, educationally reading a lot traveling a lot attending a lot of events joining a lot of groups groups like the uh, Association for Gravestone uh, gravestones, uh, AGS, and, um, and uh, Preservation Trades Network, and uh, Association for Preservation Technology, and on and on. And I was able to move laterally into somewhat uncharted waters, specializing in the historic gravestones. And uh, in 2000, so over two decades ago, I um, basically uh, gave up the existing accounts I had at that time and uh, sold off the equipment that I didn't need any longer, like a crane truck and backhoe and dump trucks, and, um, and became uh, a, a specialist in the historical stones. And so ultimately that's uh, how I got to be here. As time went on, I started to do more training uh, because there wasn't many people that were doing training in this field. There was, uh, there's a bunch of people in regional areas, but no one really um, covering wide swaths of the country. And because of my background was diverse and I was experienced at um, lifting heavy things, um, that I was able to uh, kind of take on all different types of challenges in the historic graveyards, monuments, and historic cemeteries. And so um, just a couple other highlights I'll briefly mention along the way. Um, I was invited uh, to work with uh, historic Jamestown, they call it Jamestown Rediscovery in Virginia, on uh, the Knight's Tomb, they had a project there, the Knight's Tomb they think is the oldest gravestone in America, colonial, pre-colonial, for George Yardley, uh, 1627, they are reasonably sure of that. However, um, it was originally done in brass, monumental brasses were um, installed in the ledger stone, and so they were never exactly sure if who, who the knight was, but anyone could see it's a knight in armor. And so if anyone is interested in that subject, there's videos and actually it became the top ranked video of the Jamestown Rediscovery website. And uh, it was a really interesting project. I've done ongoing work with Jamestown, which is the flagship of Preservation Virginia. And um, so um, just a couple other uh, highlights is uh, ultimately how I really got to be here is I created Atlas Preservation. Uh, for a long time I was traveling all over the country and handing out flyers telling people that after I did the training they needed to get specific supplies. I mean a lot of things people might have um, like shovels and, 
and, and, and to hand tools and things, but uh, specific things to like the adhesives and the mortars were more specialized and they weren't um, oftentimes available at a local home center or hardware store. So I would give people lists where to procure the products and materials, and it was confusing, and a lot of companies didn't want to sell small amounts, and it was not really streamlined. And so for a long time, I had the vision of being able to uh, create uh, under one roof um, a company that sold all the necessary products for this field. And so ultimately in 2016, I was able to um, follow through with that. And with my two sons, um, we created Atlas Preservation. Now, <clears throat> today I have my daughter Courtney here, who um, also works full time with Atlas. Now she joined us um, now a good part of a couple of years ago. Uh, she has a master's in, in molecular biology, actually, but um, she joined the family business and um, took a temporary slight cut in pay to um, <laughs> for, for a bigger future. And so um, we're blessed to have her here. She just joined us last night. Um, and so um, I've been on the road since um, early May. And um, I started with another event that was a three-day workshop in Hannibal, Missouri, in collaboration with a guy named Bob Yap, who's a very famous guy. He does, um, he has a, a thing called Belvedere uh, Preservation School in Hannibal, Missouri, in, uh, based in a, a beautiful um, <clears throat> bed and breakfast structure that he completely restored from bottom to top. He's a pretty famous guy, actually he used to have a show on PBS about 20 plus years ago, kind of like this old house. And so anyway, he teaches many of the workshops there himself, and he invited me to work with him there. So I was doing a workshop there already, and then when I finally committed to doing this tour, I decided I was going to start from the middle of the country. So I've actually been on the road since before this tour even started on May 18th. Um, how this tour began was in 2020 when uh, the world events affected everything. I got very frustrated with everything being shut down. And fortunately, cemeteries were um, largely exempted and considered safe, um, a, a safe place to be. And so I was able to navigate through um, a lot of muddy water and create my vision, which was to do a 48 state tour to do a workshop in every state in the entire lower 48 of America for free and open to the public to attend. This is um, a continuation of that vision. And so um, I embarked on that mission August 20 of 2020. The goal was to do 48 events in 48 states in 48 days, including travel. Oh my. Oh my. And so I set the whole thing up. Courtney helped me. She was working part-time at that time with us. And she uh, helped facilitate everything. And um, it was a very epic adventure. Um, I got snowed out of Colorado on September 6th or <laughs> September 8th. And um, it was in Leadville at 10,000 feet. So I could no longer complete the mission. And then the, the whole West Coast was on fire, so um, the smoke was too thick. I canceled the West Coast. It was not safe. And then I got rained out of Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And so all told, I had added the District of Columbia. I did 41 events in 49 days and drove 16,000 miles. I, drove, I left in a three-day-old vehicle. And um, it, it was not new when I got back. I already had a cracked windshield and a big dent on my hood. And, um, and so uh, I survived. In, 20, in 2021, I decided to do some regional tours and not embark on such an ambitious undertaking that was so um, physically challenging and costly and um, in my time as well as, um, as dollars. And so I did regional tours in different parts of America. And so then this year, it was still on my agenda to do an event in every state. There were still a few states I had never uh, worked in. I had worked in most states, either doing training workshops or projects, but there was a few states remaining. And um, so I, we put this tour together. Courtney worked diligently um, you know, from the office to um, connect and find locations in a few states. We had a lot of challenges in some of the Western states, especially where there's more cattle than people. And um, like Wyoming, and uh, I think there's under 700,000 people in the whole state, and it's um, probably about the size of you know a good part of New England. So um, one, one thing led to another. We were able to ultimately get a location in every state, and some events were 
bigger than others, but we held an event in every location. So again, we're on the home stretch now, and uh, basically just New New York and New England remaining. So we saved we saved the best for the last, and so. Um, so that's about it in a nutshell. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to start out with a short walk and talk tour. It's a beautiful site and we're blessed with actually a little breeze and some shade right now. So it's actually really, really comfortable weather for this time of year in New Jersey. Uh, I know they call it the Garden State and everything likes to grow here. Um, and um, so clearly cutting the grass and maintaining um, a site like this is challenging. Um, we're really happy to see that we were at a location yesterday with some great people in, in Delaware. However, uh, some very ill-advised maintenance procedures had been conducted at this Odd Fellow Cemetery, and they were spraying heavy Roundup around every stone. We have a handful of people. I believe this, um, this lady right in front here was with us yesterday, and another gentleman um, in the back there um, who actually were um, must have enjoyed yesterday because they traveled today to join us again today so I appreciate that greatly um, so um, the basic scope of what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, in short order get up out of the chairs and uh, we're gonna walk around and we're gonna look at different stones and we can kind of start right out at the beginning here I will say in advance there are many dangerous monuments here so don't touch anything um, or be very careful when we get into the cleaning, we'll make sure they're all safe. But just in the front row here, I'm looking at monuments like this that are at precarious angles. This is actually hanging on metal pins right now, and it has cracks in it. And so um, the, the stone beside it, even more uh, leaning. And so we are, in, as, as the day goes on, primarily in the afternoon, we will be working on some, and things like this are great candidates. We can actually straighten this and make it plumb very quickly and easily if we have the skill. And a stone like this, we can have this level and in line. The biggest danger to these is the angles and having them topple. It's even a danger to the people mowing and also visiting. And um, children as well as adults have been injured and killed by falling gravestones and monuments. Believe it or not, it's not a common occurrence, but it does happen. So we want to be really careful and safety is of the paramount uh, highest importance. It's a great place to start out, and um, sandstones were the earlier stones in Connecticut as well as uh, New Jersey. And some sandstones hold up much better than others, and you can see the differences. Um, this is also, we haven't been around historic repairs like this with the, um, the strapping that was drilled and installed with the metal. That was a, basically a state-of-the-art uh, state repair at one time, like about 100 years ago. And, um, but as a tribute to the workmanship, actually, this repair, repair they did back then is still performing. This stone is still together, and so that instead of... Um, looking uh, badly on what they've done in the past that if they didn't do this this piece uh, may very well have been completely destroyed by lawnmowers we're not going to drill and put exposed um, you know um, ferrous metals on stones today if we have um, knowledge about the field however we have to understand the history of the restoration efforts that were undertaken historically and so um, we can also um, learn from what they did um, but anyway sandstone again is one of the earlier stones that was worked um, this church building right here what is the uh, date of this building approximately uh, he just walked away 1829. okay thank you well i see the lower course in it and probably the foundation is brownstone as well uh, a brown colored sandstone which would be a similar stone probably to the gravestones and all over the country we tend to see that um, actually one way you can really learn a lot is from um, in latter era like when you get it further into the 1800s a lot of time the lower bases on marble monuments are of a local regional stone for example in indiana they tend to be indiana limestone in connecticut they tend to be connecticut sandstone and on and on and so oftentimes the older structures in the town are also made at least the foundations or lower courses are made from that same stone and so sometimes we can learn the connection between the buildings and the structures anyway sandstone is a sedimentary rock that's formed with compressed sands that get layer and layer compressed together under ancient river or lake beds and it's combined with mineral binders sandstones are widely variable in their durability and some are very strong and well compacted 
and they last a long, long time, other sandstones can just crumble and disintegrate quickly. And so what we see also is a delamination of some of the sandstones, and you'll see really a great example right here. Um, right now, this stone is very fragile, and this is a stone you don't want to clean, you don't want to brush, and if you come look at it closer, you can't really see back there, but that the, the, there's about a quarter inch panel on the front that fortunately still has all the inscription on it, and it's pulled away almost an inch. And so it's very fragile and it's hanging on and that's called delamination or a separation along bedding planes. Kind of think of it as a piece of plywood left outside. If it gets old, the glue starts to fail and it starts to peel apart. And ultimately that's what's happening. But it's interesting if you look at another one right here, this is much more solid and they may be from the same era, the same year. And this one actually, it does have a crack and there is some delamination but overall it's in much better condition but we work down the line here this one is in excellent condition there's no delamination at all and so stone varies from stone to stone um, within a quarry even in one quarry and sometimes one area in a quarry for a certain number of years could be very um, really qu high quality and then you'll get into another part of the quarry and there'll be more um, bands of different mineralization running through the stone and it might not have as much durability However, they had no idea of knowing back then how they would weather. They were all in really, you know, they were new when they made them. So what can just, we do for that then? Do, um, we just, do we just let it go and it falls apart? We can work on something like this, but it's not a simple process. So we'll come back and talk about it later because we don't want to get lost in the weeds before we get going. Um, but. Um, I'll just mention these are all tablet stones and these are like a colonial style tablet stone, pre-colonial, colonial, and um, these don't have a lot of um, symbolism, but um, I haven't seen conventional tablet stones in so long because we've been traveling to regions that are much more recent in their development and pioneer cemeteries on the west coast are latter part of the 1800s and they don't have stones like this. It's a much more modern era and they're, they're starting in more with you know marble monuments um, and so it's kind of skipping this whole part of the history but anyway tablet stones are the oldest type of stone in America generally speaking they're one piece and about a third of the stone just goes in the ground and so everyone knows like Arlington National style marble tablet stones um, but these are the uh, kind of predecessor to that and um, sandstone is one of the oldest stones in Connecticut like I mentioned um, the oldest gravestones in Connecticut are sandstone and actually are weathering really well because the quarry that they were working in, in Windsor area had a very highly compacted stone that doesn't deteriorate much. As, and I see pretty sure that some of this stone might be from Connecticut, although New Jersey had a lot of brownstone also. And Connecticut brownstone from Portland area, which was East Middletown back then, tends to delaminate very badly and disintegrate. Um, so other regions like Boston and Rhode Island had slate, and so most of the earlier gravestones there are slate, and the Boston slates are amazing, and if anyone, you can look at them, pictures online obviously, or in books, um, but if you ever have the chance to go to like the Granary or King's Chapel on Tremont in Boston, you'll be amazed at the number of stones dating from the 1600s that look like they were carved almost yesterday. And so slate tends to, a, a high quality, well compacted slate tends to be extremely durable, not affected by acids really and i say that because the marble on the other hand tends to deteriorate badly under acidic conditions and this is an example of a marble marble tablet stone and marble these marble tablet stone all of these marble stones believe it or not were originally obviously they were clean we can we can clean them too and we're going to do that in short order we're going to get into the cleaning that'll be the first thing we do with the hands-on aspect um, but believe it or not, these marble stones were all polished originally, and so they were smooth to touch. This roughness to the stone is attributed to weathering. Weathering is caused by water. Water, water, and water. However, polluted water, acidic rain, or acidic deposition deteriorates marble. This became known pretty early on historically, and as time went on, Granite became the stone of choice because marble was not doing well, manufacturing improved, and granite was available. And so this would be an example of a granite monument with dating 1899, 1889, pretty accurate. Um, this is a really dark colored um, and probably from Quincy, Mass, because that was the earliest quarry in America of a dark color. The oldest 
uh, granite building of any significance in America is at King's Chapel um, in Boston, and it's made out of this same stone. Um, I'm reasonably sure. Sometimes, um, you know, there's, there's more than one source, obviously, and as time went on, there was a tremendous number of quarries in America, um, but that certainly looks like a piece of Quincy granite to me. Um, so um, as time went on, the stones went from being tablets to having bases, and initially they had keyways in the bases, and I'm trying to see an example of a, of a slotted base. Um, and so that, in other words, a stone like this, well, a, a base like this, it could be going into a recess. But as time went on, they started to get rid of those keyways, and those bases that do have keyways in them, they could be called socket bases, slotted bases, and ultimately, those bases have mortises in them, and the stone is a tenon, and they fit together. They were affixed together with some type of material, it could be a, a sulfur, or some kind of a plaster, or mortar, um, or lead even, sometimes in a molten form. As time went on, they got they advanced in manufacturing, they got rid of those socket bases and they started just stacking the pieces, but the thinner tablets like this, they weren't going to be strong enough, so they started drilling and putting pins in. And we have a lot of good examples of pin damage here, um, so let me, um, I think I saw some, um, right where we started actually I saw some, but as we come down the line we'll look at some different conditions here as well, and we can see a fractured stone here. And um, I'm not sure what acted upon this, but this is a recent um, damage. And we can tell because we can look at how clean the break is and how sharp the break line is. And, and we are, we're gonna fix this stone today. We're gonna join this together. This is not a difficult repair to do. And so we can get this back together. Um, it's a really nice piece of, of uh, brownstone. It's really um, just so solid. You can see, you know, how um, there's no delamination at all virtually on it. So this is this will be a great repair to do. Um, and I'm just looking for some other examples of. Um, okay, so we'll head over here now. Perfect. Okay, so here's a great example of what I was just explaining. Yeah. yeah. And so this is a, a larger marble tablet that was going into a marble base, and this had a keyway. And, um, and so you can see right here that there was a tenon that partially broke off. Um, and in this style stone, the tenon was centered, but actually there was kind of wings or lap joints on the end. So the stone projected past where the tenon was. Um, the biggest cause of the failure of stones tends to be leading first. Um, and then there's also obviously storm damage and vandalism and failure of materials as well. But um, oftentimes stones tend to lean before they fall. Excuse me, this site doesn't have that much uneven terrain, but really hilly, slopey sites tend to um, encourage the stones to lean downhill. And that's called soil creep or earth creep. And it's a geological phenomenon that everything gets pushed downhill over time slowly, especially associated with very wet uh, weather events and freeze-thaw cycles. And so as time goes on, things tend to get pushed downhill. Of course, in graveyards, there's graves and graves settle. And back when all these burials were being conducted in the 1700s, um, 1800s, they were just using caskets that would then hold up for some period of time, but eventually they would start settling. And it can be an incremental process and it can take even hundreds of years, depending on the soil type and what the caskets were made of. But what I'm saying is that you get sinking associated with these caskets and sometimes that draws the stone into them. In some cemeteries they didn't have a big enough rows and sometimes the uh, gravestones are actually on top of the burials and I've worked in cemeteries like that and I, again I was a grave digger um, so that is also a factor. Um, so another thing that has changed here is there's the footstones have been removed. This is a common thing that's happened historically at many sites but the vast majority of these tablet stones representing one individual would have had an associated footstone and um, and this actually looks like the footstone for this because it's a stockier material and so I'm reasonably sure that this 
is a footstone for that headstone. This looks like a footstone for that headstone. But in other words, almost every one of these would have a footstone and they would usually be about five or six feet away for an adult, about three or four feet away for a child. And so that the footstones in many cemeteries have been removed intentionally for maintenance purposes. And so it changes the aesthetic of the site, but there would have been a lot more small stones all over the place um, in historic times. Um, any questions or comments? No, you do not weed whack around them. <laughs> okay. Very carefully trim around them. <laughs> so we can look at some different damage here. We have so many different things to look at here compared to a lot of sites that I've just been at. And here is a, a, a granite monument still well affixed to its base. Uh, I would be reasonably sure. Granite was g almost never um, mortise and tenon, so it probably has pins. And the pins are either still tightly connected or they're, they're hanging on. But whatever happened here, the whole foundation failed and the monument toppled forward. Um, we're not sure of the cause of that. However, this is very fixable. Um, usually with a granite, it's so durable that it hasn't really suffered any ill effects from this type of a situation. It just needs someone that has the skill and ability to raise it back up and, and make it stable again. Um, the, here, the bricks that are there, those were after the fact, like they weren't part of the original stone, were they? Um, so, um, foundations were installed of many different materials in different regions and actually um, this slant marker on a base has a brick foundation right behind it that is oh. elevated. Um, in some older uh, monument installations they would intentionally build um, uh, bricks above grade to make a pedestal to elevate the monument to a higher position and make it look like a bigger monument and or offset settling and so some regions do a lot of brick work and some regions have very little brick work. Um, a cemetery like Congressional Cemetery in Washington DC not actually owned by the government it never was it was originally Washington Church Parish Cemetery um, but I, I worked there on a project and, 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 and almost every monument there is set on a brick foundation. And some of those are just underground, some of them are more elevated, but bricks were used a lot in historic cemeteries in some regions and some periods of time. So, um, so you're gonna see some of that here. Um, here's a monument that is um, interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Right now it's really dangerous. <laughs> It's leaning at a big angle. It doesn't take a genius um, to know that. Any, any child could see that. The easiest way to cite the, the angle of the lean is down the row you're in, obviously, and um, then it stands out like a sore thumb. You can actually see that the foundation is highly elevated in the back and is solid under it. So it's not like something we can change easily. Um, the design of this monument is also interesting because it has a brownstone, sandstone lower base, and another um, sandstone upper base, then it converts to marble for the upper main uh, headstone portion, and then there's also a capstone. The reason I'm not touching it is because it looks like it's about to topple. It has a capstone that is offset forward, cantilevered, because it's aesthetically pleasing to the eye, and it was the design of the stone. However, it's already leaning that direction. This is certainly encouraging it to lean that direction, and so it's a very unstable monument. Um, because there's a solid foundation under it and the base is actually not very thick for a monument like this because I can see the whole edge It's only about a six seven inch thick base that a monument like this has got to be taken apart to fix It's too dangerous. We can't work with it some of them We can just um, put a bar under and lever and tip and pack material under it like we did yesterday for those folks that were there But this is not a candidate for that. So this should be disassembled and then and then and then rebuilt is what needs to happen now the other thing i see is deterioration on the on the sandstone that's a separate problem that happens in, with some sandstones in some situations it's kind of an alluvial <laughs> weathering and um and and that itself um, can eventually cause issues really that's not causing the problem right now the lean is um any questions about yeah anything? that wouldn't have been a carved wooden thingy that's alluvial the K? I don't understand the Sorry. I, well, I'm from Indiana. They did a lot of tree things in Indiana, as you well know. So I'm saying is that 
really the alluvial ware, or was it carved to look like? Carved? Absolutely not. This was this Thank was you. square edge, smooth, clean, Perfect. polished. Good this answer. is all Thank you. all worn away. In fact, you can see on the back what it originally looked like. There was a little um, a kind of molded edge to it, which okay. is kind of like a wash, um, like a decorative feature. But this is pure weathering. Like that was a square edge. Got it. So um, yeah, tree stump monuments are interesting. I don't see any here. Um, we actually were in Columbus, uh, Montana, where there was sandstone tree stump monuments that were very large. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. He's so close to the other guy. You know, Elias is so close. Is, uh, is he not, um, why is he so close? Very good question. I, I can't answer that question. So um, I'm not sure if they changed. Is this an aisle? Like that? Well, that, yeah, they also the, uh, the whole aisle. Yeah. Exactly. So that gets yeah. to do if there's burials in front or in back, and if they're changing within one cemetery. The um, the European and colonial tradition was to lay the deceased to rest so they could sit up for resurrection toward the rising sun. That had to do with the east-west orientation. But as far as what side the headstone is on, and as far as the way they rode things, is a whole other story. Um, so yeah, it looks like there's like a pathway here. In order to establish a pathway like that, then the, this monument would have to be have this in front, and that would be in back. If they change the pattern, it's very confusing, and also um, it's ripe for graves being dug in the wrong place um, because the grave digger, um, you know, is not always um, on track with design changes. Um, so we can continue. It's getting hot in the sun. We'll try to duck in the shade. <laughs> so was that? Sorry, was that one sandstone and marble? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sandstone, base sandstone and lower bases, and all marble upper elements. Yes, <laughs> the two el the two uh, things are combined. Not always um, a great thing to do, but um, you can see all three of these big marble monuments are all leaning backward. Um, if you look down the line right here, you don't need uh, you don't need to measure or have a, a level to see that these are all dangerous monuments. Um, they're all large monuments. As as time went on, the monuments tended to get bigger and more robust in their dimensions. They moved away from the thin tablets, which are highly susceptible to breakage, and moved on to bigger monuments and started stacking the pieces. Um, by 1900, Sears Roebuck got in the monument business, and they were uh, brought the cost down. Um, uh, Montgomery Ward uh, was also selling monuments for a period of time. Um, this style monument would have probably been in there. Um, playbook. In 1900, also, um, the three biggest sources for marble in America were Vermont, Georgia, and Tennessee, although Tennessee actually had a limestone um, that they called granite. I gotta tie my shoe. I'm reasonably sure this is Tennessee marble. In fact, I'm almost positive. It tends to have a, a pink color to it, and it tends to not um, be as polished um, when it's new. Um, and actually, this has some writing on the side. I'm not sure what that is. If that was done later, it looks like. Inches thick are the single biggest problem in historic graveyards in a lot of America, even into Canada. They made, like, I would say hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure exactly how many, but they made many, many thousands of stones like this. Honestly, these it's amazing these are standing. These are so fragile. When these were new, they were stronger. But as the marble weathers, which was unexpected or unknown how it would weather, it gets more porous. It actually loses density. And it gets a, a, a term would be friable. It's more brittle, like a piece of brittle candy or something. And so if a mower hits something like this hard, it'll just snap it off. It doesn't even have to be that hard. And you have to realize also that these cemetery, the graveyards in this in the earlier era when these were being installed, they didn't cut the grass much, okay? They didn't make putting greens. The grass would never be low like this. Under rare, rare circumstances, they would cut it very occasionally. They would feed the livestock with the grass, okay? They were not, the expectation was not to have well-groomed grass. And so it's a false expectation. One of the ways to save money on historic graveyards is to cut the grass less often. They're cut too much and they're cut too close. Weeds were prevalent historically, okay? So it's not an accurate uh, picture of, of really what it looked like. But stones like this that are still standing are amazing. However, once they break, 
and this one has been previously repaired with a hard cement and it rebroke, they're very problematic. The marble tends to get really um, grainy and they call that sugaring sometime. There's a more technical term called granular disintegration when it just starts to lose the mineral binders and it just starts to break down and, and, and sometimes it just disintegrates. Um, so we can see the inscription is actually on this side on these and if you come around, they still are readable with the best lighting. The lighting is not ideal right now. Um, a raking angle, which would be from the side, would be the best for reading the stones. Actually, this one has a raking angle on it right now. It's very strange the way these are changing directions. And here's like another pathway. And so we have this one reading this way, this one reading this way. Um, in older, more like, um, uh, maybe that's why they call it a reformed church. Um, <laughs> in, in, in churches that were more um, strict, they would never have stones changing directions. They would all read the same direction. And, um, and so um, it's interesting how they did that. And um, I don't know the history here. So I'm just, I'm just observing what I see. Uh, but a lot of really big, really thin tablets. I mean, this is unbelievable that this is still standing. And I'm just looking, um, it's, it's a little warped, but it's not very warped. Sometimes marble, especially when it's tall and leaning, will warp a lot. And marble is one of the few kinds of stone that will warp without breaking. And so it's very unusual um, in that way. But it's amazing this is still standing. Uh, here's another example. Highly eroded stone. And again, think about this stone. It was originally completely smooth, smooth as silk, polished to touch. The uneven weathering is attributed to, again, acid, rain, and, and just rain in general, but also the stone had a variable mineralization, so it didn't wear away evenly, and so it was like a cake batter that wasn't fully integrated, so there's harder parts of the stone. These have, they call this veining a lot of time, because these areas that are projecting high look like veins, and so actually the highest points are the original thickness of the stone, and the stone is worn away all around it because the minerals within the stone were weaker, and the high point was like veins of calcite, the mineral, which is much more durable and hard and is not really being affected by the acids much. We can look closer and see all kinds of things and you can see a crack coming right here. There's a pin right here. Usually on a stone like this, there's two pins and this is cracking at the pin. This one here is shifted sideways. It's completely loose um, and they're also leaning backward that away. Um, these interestingly also have granite bases, these two monuments here. Um, a nice fine grain granite base, and, um, and they put the marble on top. So granite was available then, those bases are original. However, uh, marble was still preferred for the aesthetic beauty and the striking white nature of the marble. And most of these marble tend to be white, I'm seeing, um, but marble also was sometimes gray um, and other colors if different minerals were mixed in. And just the basic geology is that I mentioned sandstone. So limestone is the saltwater counterpart to sandstone, which is formed under uh, ancient uh, saltwater oceans. And limestone starts out as like uh, clams and oysters and you know all the shellfish that are popular you know down by the coast in Jersey and those organisms don't live that long those are almost pure calcium carbonate that's why they're so white they're just like the marble but those shells get broken down turn into sands get compressed together and they form um, the ancient ocean beds of limestone if limestone gets heat and pressure under geologic time it, limestone becomes marble and so limestone and marble are related materials in their most common forms and um, marble becomes crystallized limestone the fossils and shells that would be visible with a small magnification get destroyed and the the, the marble becomes crystallized um, so any questions about anything and we'll move forward into cleaning shortly yeah over there okay sure these are very slate like headstones and these are buried. Is there anything underneath of them? What, Bodies. What, what? <laughs> or is it I'll just in there like a piece of toast? If they are a traditional tablet stone, they are a one-piece stone, and they're monolithic, and they are just stuck in the ground. Um, however, when they installed them, they could have put loose rocks or bricks or anything to shore them up. But if it's, they are a traditional tablet stone, that, in, that definition means they are a one-piece stone. It is also possible, especially as 
in the later eras that they have underground bases that you might not see and that would be like a mortise and tenon base which we discussed however they could have a crude mortise and tenon base that was meant to be just like an anchor to hold them upright but not meant to be seen and so we don't know unless we start digging what's under them but most of these appear to be traditional tablet stones which are simply held up by the earth approximately a third of the length of the stone so if a stone is this big it's probably this far underneath and so in order to straighten them we have to dig all the way around a ring around them um, you know and have someone help us support it because when we get to the lower part it could just collapse and then we carefully can straighten them and pack a gravel around them and one of the, the most important thing to do to a stone like this some people are afraid of this because if you touch it you'll break it well you will break it if you muscle it and don't handle it properly but if you handle it properly you could make it safe and stronger and and last indefinitely because the issue is the angle and eventually if the angle continues it'll end up breaking forward and so straightening stones is one of the most important and simplest things you can do um, but it's a lot of hard work with the excavation yeah yeah question about straightening stones because I'm looking at these here they're leaning but they're not leaning forward or back they're leaning into the middle and they're supported by the one in the middle. Is that an issue or is that a relatively stable threesome there? Good, good point. That is more cosmetic than it is structural. Generally speaking, uh, structural issues and for the safety of the public with multi-piece monuments, tablets not as much relevance, but as far as safety and as far as uh, safety to the stone not breaking, it's generally a front to back issue. Side to side like this is more cosmetic, so you're absolutely right. These are actually all kissing each other and touching. They are all stabilizing each other. I would leave these alone. These are not an issue to work on. If these belong to some family and they said we want to redo them and make them nice and clean them, I, I wouldn't discourage that, but I would not select these to work on based on the site here. Th these are not a priority. Um, so that's a great question. Yeah? The soil here is extremely hard clay. So it has a stability that is unexcelled as you go around the country here. When you dig in here, uh, like these stones, these tablet stones that have been put in place, they were just packed in with this hard clay that okay. was right there at the time. Got it. And, uh, hard were, digging in clay. Yeah. But clay represents its own issues, uh, but it is, uh, it can, you know, if it's well compacted, then it doesn't move around as easy as other things, certainly. Um, clay tends to, yeah, so um, th that's a good thing in many respects, but it makes it very hard to dig and work on things later. And um, so um, all soils have their pros and cons, but um, clay soil, so in, in, all, in reference to that, it must have been a lot of fun to dig the graves by hand here in solid clay. <laughs> Right. So usually there's different levels and you go through some topsoil and then, you know, there might be a little sand and then, you know, I, I don't know what the topography, this, what this the... Clay, this clay goes down six, eight feet. Got it. And then you have wow. little, you know, uh, <coughs> topsoil, of course. Okay. But, uh, other than that, it's clay all the way down. Got it. And even it, in the newer it? section, they didn't regrade. And sometime in cemeteries, they do landscape work and there's there's material brought in, so it's not always consistent. But anyway, yeah, soils affect the, the, the stability a lot. And um, so apparently we have clay here, so um, we'll keep that in mind. So that's going to make it really hard to reset tablet stones um, if it's a hard clay. Um, just, uh, just the nature of the beast, yeah. And this one here that just slightly slid off? Yep. Can you just muscle that back? Depends how big your muscles are. Well, I mean, like, if, <laughs> I mean, like if you use clamps or something like that, could you, can, can you just simply, or do you want to have to lift it up? I can push this back. The first issue here is that it's leaning that away. And so that um, the, 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 the fact that it's pushed sideways, it looks like it might have got hit by a mower or something because there's some chips there. And usually stones don't go left to right um, that are heavy, that are situated, um, not leaning on a big angle left to right. Um, but yeah, we can work with this without taking it apart. Okay. Um, but the thing that's uh, more uh, of concern is that it's leaning that away. So we could dig around it and then lever it from the back to plumb this first. And then we could align it and we could also rejoin it. And so I would do that sequentially. The first thing I do um, is push it back this way. So it's we could center it on the base. Um, we can do that. This we'll, one's fairly plumb. The next yeah. one's leaning. That's a, that's all relative. If we put a if we put a level on it, <laughs> it'll be it'll be out. Um, 
farther than you think. This one has been uh, repaired at some point, so we don't want to test that. But agree, that one is leaning way worse than this one. No, no debate there. Um, so we'll look at a few more. Um, these are kind of past that point. Here's an example of a, of a tablet stone Ooh, that not in good shape. Is, is, well, it's cracked out at the, uh, at the keyway. However, it was repaired at one point, it looks like, probably, because it's still all together. So something like this that's standing and all together, probably the best thing to do would be to just repoint all that in place and fill all those cracks and stabilize it. And that would make it really strong. And so that's a pretty simple thing to do. These obviously have fallen completely. Um, the underlying thing is the, the bases are at such a big angle. You can see actually what appears to be a slate sub base under it. And, um, and so, um, yeah, these would have to be, first you have to lower the lower bases and then reconstruct the upper portion. Does the, does the upper portion stay together if you go to lift it up? Sometimes, and that makes it very challenging to work on. And so it makes it heavier and awkward. And worst case scenario is when there's pins and they're loose but they won't come apart. And so then you have to fight with that whole situation. So it's easier if the pieces all come apart. Uh, uh, the flip side is if it's solidly joined, like the N1 looks like it is, then provided you have the uh, mechanical ability and skill, it, it will go together quickly once you lift it because right. you have one less thing to join. Yeah, okay. But it makes it heavy and awkward to work with. Right. And so um, a trickier, more uh, kind of uh, lift, uh, clearly. What kind of weight um, is that? What kind of weight do you suspect that? Um, I mean, uh, so gra gra granite weighs about 200 pounds a cubic foot, maybe 185. Marble's about 165. Um, these look like the headstone portion's about six inches thick. It looks like it's about almost, if it, uh, not far off from two by four feet, which is about eight cubic feet. Uh, eight superficial feet, which would be four cubic feet, which would convert to this piece of stone being about 600 pounds. I just did that like, you know, that's a ballpark. This lower base, probably another 200. So this is probably about an 800 pound chunk of stone. Just some are speculating on it, but uh, something like that. Mount Auburn in Cambridge over the Charles from Boston being the first significant garden cemetery attributed to being starting, helping start a garden rural cemetery movement in America. Um, those cemeteries had pre-need lot sales where you could buy large lots and you could also do things initially in those cemeteries like put in fences, put up curbing, plot enclosures, and different architectural elements that would uh, be basically on your property. You could develop your property um, and maintain <laughs> it yourself even within the grounds of the cemetery. Um, so these kind of fences were kind of representative of that era. Another thing I didn't really touch on is the iconography or the symbolism within the cemetery. And that's represented by the different styles and shapes. And that also became, there was different symbols in the colonial times, but as we get into the garden cemetery movement in the 1800s, the revival movements became most pre predominant in America. And like the obelisks we see, like that obelisk right there, here's another very large obelisk here, probably the largest piece in the cemetery, represent Egyptian revival. The finial on top of here is basically a closed urn, and that would represent uh, mourning, which is Greek revival symbolism, the caps, and so we're gonna see Gothic revival symbolism and a fusion of different um, symbolisms that are combined to make American monuments unique and they're um, kind of all in their Americanized form. Yeah. Um, but th this is a really cool enclosure here. You can see they're um, working mm -hmm. on preserving it by painting it. Um, but there was different um, types of metal were used. And um, in fact, um, Sears Roebuck started selling some kinds of fences a few years before they started selling monuments in 1897. Um, and so we'll just look at this last monument here and then we're gonna uh, take a break for a few minutes. Uh, since you were talking about yeah, the iconography, I, like I noticed uh, somewhere up towards the corner of the church there are some of the old sandstone ones with like the skull and crossbones looking. Right. They're I, up yeah, there. Awesome. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have time to go over there, so I'll check those out later. Um, here's a really large obelisk. Again, looks like the tallest monument in the cemetery. Very fine grained granite. No polish on this at all. Um, this is Westerly from Westerly, Rhode Island. 
This was the most coveted premier granite in America, the finest, most consistent grain. It was quarried till it didn't exist anymore. So they sought this granite out and they made a statement by putting no polish on it because that was very fashionable in that era to be low key about it. Um, just another couple things I'll mention stands out. So um, this line right here is actually a ribbon of lead. The entire monument is stacked on lead. There are no pins, there's no glue, there's no adhesive. It's just lead ribbon around the set, like an old typewriter ribbon, but in this case, probably about a quarter inch thick maximum. And it's literally stacked on those lead uh, wedge pieces. And this monument also is virtually straight up and down for practical purposes. The larger feature pieces like this, I'll call it, were generally the monument installers had huge, um, financial interests in monument like this. In other words, if this started to lean like 10 or 15 years later, they were gonna be in trouble because the families were gonna be on them <coughs> and they did really good foundations under big monuments most of the time. And how did they do them in this era? That varied, it could be loose stones. It's not, not one way to put them together, but if they're stacked in a way that's really tight, like a dry stone wall, um, you can make a really good foundation in many ways. But what it requires is a deep wall hole, square walled hole. And we're reading about historical um, references, um, regulations in big cemeteries in New York City. Um, in as early as 1915, that foundations on large monuments were six feet deep. You can and see so, a little bit of the foundation on this side over here. Yep, I do. I see a tiny bit peeking through. Yep, top course, which could be slate or something. Um, so um, that's about it on the intro. We're seeing incredible weathering on this monument. Wow since everyone made it this far. Um, this is also a raised letter style. I'll mention that as well. Right now, another family plot here. Um, this one has the uh, marble balusters connected with the iron um, elements. Again, this is on the lead. This is raised letters. Just a couple things. Uh, what was typical in historic monuments, a drop wash like this, which is an architectural feature, aesthetically pleasing to the eye, also sheds water away from the monument. Um, in this era, around 1900, this would be dated somewhere right around there. Uh, large raised letters like this project out of the stone. Everything had to be carved away, leaving these letters. Um, the, the roughness down here is called rock pitch, and this also has a margin on it. Um, and so they would polish the whole face and then they incise the carving um, to carve the letters. And, um, and you can see from this time, this is the reason they moved over to granite monuments. There's a lot of dates on here, so I'm not sure of the installation, but um, you can see it looks like it was installed yesterday. It's in perfect condition. And the granite will tend to be that way. Even if it's from, you know, 1890, it'll look like it's brand new um, in most situations. So um, it's about it on this aspect. Um, I could go on all day, but we're gonna try to move on to another subject. Um, I have a question on these. Sure. Two. This is a husband wife, and the monuments are very similar, but they aged very differently, even though they're only two, ten years apart. Do you yeah. know like, why that happens? That's a great question, and, um, and it's not always an easy answer. But, um, and just, uh, just to back up a little, the fact that these are for individuals is almost insane. Um, another thing you could notice on these is that the bases are granite and in absolutely mint condition, and the granite bases are gonna stop any significant rising damp. Um, what I would attribute it to is a different origin of stone, and um, the most coveted uh, marble would have been imported Carrara marble, and it did not tend to weather well in many situations because it's almost pure calcium carbonate. It's often the impurities within the stone that will give it more durability. Um, it is also possible um, that certain stones could have been improperly or aggressively cleaned, and that could have contributed to varying weathering. But when I see stones that are similar ages and one is much more deteriorated than another, usually I look toward different material it was created from, and it could have been even a higher grade material initially more white or a finer grain and it just did not weather as well in the long term of modern conditions so um, that, that's what I would look toward is this a stone carver signature down here yeah e uh, probably um, E.B. Elburn or whatever yes. his name is yes 
So that would be for the memorial company. Yeah, a maker's mark would be an attribution. Sometimes, sometime at the bottom of the headstone, sometime on a wash, um, sometime on the back.